Welcome back, everyone, as we continue the story of Frederick the Great with episode four. If you haven't seen the first three episodes of my reaction, the link is in the description below, as well as the link to the original uh, content by Extra History. Uh, be making sure that you have your notifications turned on uh, and subscribed if you're not already. I would love if you would consider that. Got some big announcements coming up in the next couple of days. Some major things happening with the channel as well as some things coming up down the road that I'm looking forward to telling you about. And I've also heard from people uh, stories, and not just on our channel, but other channels as well, of people finding out that they're unsubscribed and they didn't even realize that they were, that sometimes it just happens for some reason. So I don't know what that's about, but let's go ahead and dive into today's episode. Berlin, December 28th, 1746. The newspapers, the banners, and the choirs of children all have a new name for their monarch, Frederick the Great. And the reasons are obvious to everyone who greets him as he returns victorious from the Second Silesian War. Not only had the Prussian army won every battle, Frederick had personally led his forces. At the Battle of Soar, Charles of Lorraine had ambushed Frederick's camp, the Austrians outnumbering his army nearly two to one, but Frederick fought his way free. Then when Prussia was under its greatest threat, when Austria and Saxony planned a two-pronged invasion to take Berlin, Frederick and his general had defeated both forces, taking Saxony's great city of Dresden and negotiating an end to the war. That's why the newspapers call him the Great. That and the fact that he'd probably written ahead to inform them all of his new title. But if you've been watching this... He had probably written ahead to inform them all of his new title. Listen, we, we know from the beginning of the story that Frederick had some pretty significant trauma in his childhood. Uh, that would have probably messed a lot of us up. Uh, he also is a person who's almost certainly homosexual at a time when, for anybody, that was a big problem, but especially for someone who was a hereditary ruler who was expected to pass his title on. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on here, but let's not also ignore the fact that he's kind of compensating for that with some 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 narcissism that's going on here. Not that that's necessarily unique to him. That's something that's pretty common among rulers, especially when you're a ruler who has been told all your life that you are divinely ordained to be in the position that you are. So, show for any extended period of time, you're probably going to be familiar with the next precedent. A great monarch cannot know peace for long. Do you want to see the next episode of this series immediately after watching this one instead of having to wait a full week? Well, now with the new Nebula first, you totally can. Learn how after the episode. Victory in the First and Second Silesian Wars secured Prussia's reputation as a rising power and Frederick as a man to be reckoned with. It also bought him a decade of peace and splendor that could be attributed to not only his battlefield skill, but also two of his tenants when it came to warfare. In a decade of peace, it doesn't sound like very long in the grand scheme of things. But think about how rare that's been in European history. I mean, just going back to, I mean, I guess there's not really a time you can go back to where there isn't significant warfare happening in Europe. But just thinking around his time, I mean, you're talking about, we mentioned this already, you've got 30 years war and there's an 80 years war and you've got the Great Northern War. And so you've constantly got shifting alliances and fighting and, and people con uh, conquering territories and consolidating empires. And after this, we're going to have the Seven Years War and we're going to have the Napoleonic Wars and, you know, just on and on and on it goes. The first was that Frederick believed over all else in the power of military speed. He who got his army out and able to act first won. And the best way to lose a conflict was to draw it out. He knew the Prussian army couldn't remain effective indefinitely, so his wars needed a quick conclusion. This mindset is a common one, too, and this is one of the reasons why when you get to World War I, which granted is still a ways off, I mean almost 200 years away, uh, but when you get to World War I and you have a war that doesn't go that way, right? You know, think of the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, right? 1870-71. Uh, it's a pretty quick war. Germany comes in, they take Paris pretty quickly, there's some fighting that goes on, but pretty much it's a couple of battles and boom, the war's over. That's the attitude that they had, was that this is how it was going to be done. Napoleon fights a few battles and wins most of his wars of, of the coalition. Then, of course, Spain gets bogged down and, and, and Russia gets bogged down, and so it eventually doesn't go that way. But you want to avoid long, protracted wars if at all possible, especially in a time when most men die of disease rather than on the battlefield. 
And the second reason was that while Frederick was good at war, he didn't like it. Even his mentor, Eugene of Savoy, had commented on this when Frederick was a young officer, and he meant it as a compliment. Frederick wasn't bloodthirsty. Frankly, he'd rather be at the new summer home he'd built in Potsdam, which he'd given the French name of Sans Souci, or... <laughs> so, uh, curious to know if you can relate to that. I certainly can. To be good at something, but you don't like it. Um, I, I'm guessing we can all probably kind of see ourselves in that, but let me know in the comment section below. Is there something you're good at, but you can't stand doing it? Or without worries. There, in an environment of his own design, he was free to write poetry, play the flute, display his porcelain collection, dote over his beloved greyhounds, and gather about him an inner circle of philosophers and military officers, all of them male, as women were banned. Oh, yeah, just a quick FYI here, Frederick was also a huge misogynist, which at least partway explains his antagonism towards both Maria Theresa and Empress Elizabeth of Russia. Also, if a guy in his inner circle ever got married, he often kicked them out. Said circle he hmm. developed included some of the most prominent minds in Europe, including his old editor Voltaire, who came to live in Prussia after stirring the pot a little too much in France. He so think about that. Think about the pressure that's on you. You want to get married or you feel you have to get married, uh, but you know that getting married gives you a family and gives you a lot of things you probably might want, but it also cuts you off from access to the king and from being a part of court. Tough. He also provided safe harbor to Julien Offre de la Métrie, a scandalous philosopher whose work argued that humans were just organic machines, no better than animals, and that the mind and soul were part of the body rather than a spiritual entity. In fact, he literally argued that humans were nothing more than a digestive system. Hot stuff at the time, especially since he denied the existence of God and advocated the pursuit of pleasure. And you bet these ideas jived with Frederick, who was privately an outspoken atheist. In fact, he found pretending to be religious one of the hardest parts of the masquerade he'd had to perform for his father. Hmm. He once wrote that Christianity was a fiction, invented in the fevered minds of Asia, with its followers in Europe either being fanatics, imbeciles, or those pretending belief in order to gain power. That's a, that's a gutsy thing to do at a time when most people in Europe are Christians, or at least profess to be. Um, this, I mean, granted, we're getting to the time of the Enlightenment and when you're going to see deism and things like that. To be openly not just anti-religious, but atheistic. And I don't know if he was really atheistic or agnostic, because they said earlier he was agnostic, but now they're saying atheist. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is not a popular viewpoint to express, especially if you are a king. He also jokingly suggested Jesus and the Apostle John were gay lovers. So suffice to say, at the time, Frederick was unconventional in his views. But that also led to tolerant religious policies that saw all Protestant groups given equality and Catholics allowed to practice, though not allowed in civil service. However, he was also extremely anti-Semitic. Jews could live in Prussia, but had to pay a tax for security. Which, honestly, is just like Frederick. Seriously, for everything you learn about him that you like, he'll tend to have an equally awful quality. And that's definitely... But you know what? That's, that's not uncommon with historic figures in general, is it? I mean, there's very few historic figures out there that don't have some parts of their lives that when we look at it, we're just like, oh, man, really, dude? Uh, there are a few that aren't like that, or maybe we just don't know about it. Because some people have demons that maybe their vices, their demons, their flaws are not as visible as others. Definitely a pattern that's gonna come up again and again. So watch out for that. This decade also provided his first really prolific period of writing. Partly, these histories were meant to burnish his reputation and iron out less complimentary episodes in his career. He exaggerated enemy numbers at Malwitz, for instance, claiming that the Austrians had a much larger force than they did and casting his flight from the battlefield as a reluctant but daring escape. In addition, he wrote his first book on military theory, primarily to distribute to his generals. Hmm. He also drilled his troops, because Frederick wanted to be ready for the next war. He innovated, adopting a new system of formation marching that ensured troops could quickly reposition, change direction, and adopt new formations on the battlefield. So again, this, is, this goes back to the idea that Frederick is a guy that whatever he does, he does 100%. He learns, he grows, he adapts. 
if he recognizes, whether he likes warfare or not, whether he likes the military aspect of, of his kingship or not, he's going to be good at it because he's, he's going to insist to himself that he's good at whatever he has to do. Uh, and he's going to put his stamp on it. And I think this is something he's learned from his father, whether he'd want to admit that or not. He figured out ways to go over broken ground or ditches while maintaining order and adopted snare drums as a way of conveying orders, hmm. since they were easier to hear amidst the battle than a human voice. He also promoted his younger brothers. Wait, did we not mention he had brothers? Well, he did, and they served as officers in the Silesian Wars, but now were made generals. Of the two, his youngest brother, Prince Henry, would become the most dependable. Henry had many things in common with Frederick, like his head for tactics and a tendency towards affairs with fellow officers. But he was also notably more measured. And Frederick would need dependable generals because by 1756, uh, Europe go. was about to see its first world war. Now, it 100%. I mean, the Seven Years War, whether we can say it was the first one or not, it definitely was a world war. Here in the States, we grew up learning about it as the French and Indian War uh, because the British were fighting against the French and Indian allies that they had. But it was just an extension of the Seven Years' War. It would be far too much to describe in this series how the Seven Years' War started, since the motivations are enormously complicated. Like the War of Austrian Succession, it was an umbrella conflict that encompassed a lot of little wars. But in Central Europe, it was all about Silesia again. See, when Frederick took Silesia, the Protestant state of Brandenburg, Prussia, essentially announced itself as a challenger to Catholic Austria, which had held sway over the Holy Roman Empire for centuries. Mm -hmm. Worse, it gave Prussia a border right on Bohemia, meaning Prussia could invade Austrian lands at will. And Bohemia today is roughly uh, Czech Republic or Czechia as they call it now. Austria needed Silesia back and Prussia crushed. So. Through a series of both public and secret diplomatic agreements, Maria Theresa had entered defensive alliances with both Russia and Saxony to support each other in case of Prussian aggression, then decimate Brandenburg, Prussia, and partition it amongst themselves. Frederick, hmm. for his part, had his eye on Saxony and Polish West Prussia. Why does that matter? It unites all of this territory, right? That's the goal here, is you've got all these kind of scattered territories and you're trying to unite it all. And of course, then just aesthetically speaking, it makes sense to grab some of Western Poland too at that point. The conquest of which could link up his broken territories. But for all of his supposed genius, he badly bungled his diplomacy. What protected him from the Austro-Russian alliance was the support of France. But he also pursued and signed an alliance with its rival, Britain promising not to attack the British royal family's German possessions of Hanover. Remember, King George II, uh, beginning with his father, King George I, they are the Hanoverian dynasty. They are the rulers of Hanover, who happen to be the nearest uh, Protestant people in line to the throne. So everybody who was Catholic got bypassed in the line of succession after Queen Anne died. And so it goes all the way over to Sophia, who is the Electress of Hanover, and then her title passes to her son, Georg Ludwig I, uh, and then through them. Uh, the Hanover dynasty technically goes all the way through until you get to Edward VII, who would be the first king of what we know today as the House of Windsor. In exchange for Britain, funding Frederick in case of war. But that agreement blew up the balance of diplomacy in Europe. So much so that it's now known as the Diplomatic Revolution of 1756. France became furious with Frederick for allying with its enemy Britain, leaving France isolated without any allies in Europe. And this wasn't the first time he'd screwed them over diplomatically either. There had been that secret truce with Austria during the First Silesian War, then making a separate peace with Austria and dropping out of the Second Silesian <laughs> Nice. Uh, the Simpsons meme. I had a feeling that's where that was going. Listen. He's going to do what's best for him and for his nation. And he doesn't care who he uses to get it, who he uh, is going to deceive, manipulate, pit against other people. This is all about making Prussia stronger and doing what's best for Prussia. In war. So, yeah, you could hardly blame France when they dropped Frederick as an ally and aligned with Austria. And the Russians, furious with the British having simultaneously negotiated a peace with them and their enemy Prussia, also pledged troops to Austria. Mm. This was a massive realignment of powers, and everyone started preparing for war. Frederick... And they're all thinking, how are we going to divvy up Prussia? 
who's going to get what pieces. We're going to just basically tear apart Frederick's uh, kingdom and he's going to have nothing left. Seeing this, true to form, decided to strike first. And on August 26th, 1756, he led his troops into Saxony. But this would not be Silesia all over again. Frederick blundered his way into an ambush in the fog, his troops raked by fire of hidden artillery and infantry. In a confused engagement, his cavalry charged twice without orders, and he accidentally fired on his own troops. Mm. While able to later spin it as a victory, the Austrians left the battle. He didn't lose, he merely failed to win. Since they only wanted to halt Frederick, it was in reality a narrow defeat. These are not the same Austrians, his officers muttered. Turns out, the enemy had been training too. Though he managed to capture Saxony, as was his plan, and impress their military into his own, but he did have to wait until winter ended to attack Prague, hoping to capture it and then march on Vienna. But then the Austrians met him at Prague. He attacked their positions across what appeared to be grassy hills, but that were, in reality, fish ponds. Uh. They took the heights, but at a cost. In five hours, Frederick lost 14,000 men and two of his best generals, wow. including the one that had saved him at Mulvitz. Wow. Depleted, he decided to take Prague by starving them out in a siege rather than by assault. But that was when the Austrian relief army of 54,000 came for him, and he was made to split his forces, leaving a detachment at the siege and facing the oncoming army with only 34,000 men. Soon, it would be Prussia against the world. Prussia against the world. Man, this is good. I need to know what happens next, but we'll have to wait until tomorrow to do that. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Let's continue the conversation about Frederick, about Prussia, about the Seven Years' War. Uh, a lot of discussions to be had there. So hit that like button if you would as well. I'd appreciate that. Thanks for watching.